The Visitor's Tale, as told to Hubert Moore. Victor. I don't know whether that was his real name. It was what I called him and what I shall call him now. I don't know whether Victor came from the Gambia, as he said he did, but it's not really a visitor's job to challenge stories. Victor was clearly a very able young man, and he had been chosen to be one of his government's elite of special soldiers. These young men were trained to track down dissidents, torture them, frighten them, maybe kill them. Victor found this work so distressing, he said, that he deserted, stole a passport, left the Gambia forever, as he hoped, and headed for this country. Soon after he arrived, he was arrested and taken to the detention centre that I was visiting at the time. My previous detainee had been moved elsewhere, and it was arranged that I should visit this young man from the Gambia, Victor. Getting into a detention centre is, of course, quite a business. Reasonably enough, you have to bring identification with you, passport, driving licence, utilities bill. On one occasion, I had forgotten all these, but happened to have with me a copy of one of my own books of poetry. A bit sheepishly, and rather assuming that poems would prove useless when required to open prison doors, I offered my book to reception. There was a photo of me on the back of the book, which the man at the desk gazed at scornfully for several seconds. Then, wonderfully broad-mindedly, he accepted the book as identification, and I was allowed in. In one detention centre I visited, there's a deep moat with a bridge over it and a massive prison door to go through. In another, there is a succession of smaller locked doors, each one taking you a little bit further away from your free and casual life outside, towards a life of restriction and surveillance inside. Some of these centres have a buffer zone between the building used for reception and the actual centre. This buffer zone is a sort of yard across which you have to walk on a designated footpath to get from one building to the other. Keep to the footpath or cut across. Crossing the yard. Between reception and the building not quite opposite, where detention stutters inwards through its seven locked doors. They've painted for the benefit of us, the undetained, two dotted lines to keep us on the straight and the obedient, crossing at right angles a sort of yard. Right angles. At least let's go to visit detainees diagonally at wrong angles. Arriving at the room set aside for visits, what strikes me is that this is a sort of no man's land, a place where the detained can come through and mix with visitors on neutral ground. Detainees can have time with their partners and children. Visitors can drink hot chocolate, and so can the detainees they are visiting. We can talk confidentially to each other, I think. Without this neutral ground to meet on, it's almost unthinkable what life would be like for some of the detainees. But it's not neutral ground, of course. It's detention centre ground. This is one of those arrangements, civilised in themselves, like non-bullying policies in institutions which are designed to deter, if not actually to bully. Arrangements which help an essentially inhumane setup to seem caring and respectable. Visit rooms, and especially their arrangements, have important things to say. To visitors they say, here you can talk with detainees in a thoroughly decent, reasonably comfortable, utterly orderly place. To detainees, they say, here you may sit and talk as though it were your home. 
but this is not your home. It is purpose furnished to house you, but not in any way to resemble a home. And what about seating arrangements? Melanie Friend is very revealing about this in her excellent book, Border Country. At Haslar, apparently, detainees sat on red chairs and visitors on green. In at least three other detention centres, detainees sit by themselves on a single fixed seat and visitors on the row of two or three fixed chairs opposite. Colour code. Your detainee will be required to sit on a bright red chair. A bright green non-bullying policy operates. No offence is intended, no sentence pronounced. A bright red non-freeing policy operates. You sit on a bright green chair when you visit. So what's it like sitting in a detention centre and being with a detainee? Well, this oppositeness of seats, this apparent squaring up to each other, needn't matter at all. You bring with you your warmth, your interest, a readiness to acknowledge, that's really important, and an ability to listen. The main thing is you're sitting with a fellow human being. Lovely, easygoing Samuel used to tell me about his nomadic upbringing in South Africa. He was stateless. His parents never got around to registering him. Samuel had become a member of a group of travelling actors, and he'd been across the world with these actors. When he was in Vietnam, he decided he would try to get refugee status in the UK, so he flew here, only to be arrested and sent to a detention centre, where... Samuel was a rarity, a real one-off amongst detainees. He loved the life. The evenings, choosing which TV channel to watch in his dormitory, the company, the leisure, the visits. I used sometimes to ask him how his case was progressing, had he got a good solicitor, and he would look at me with a huge smile. God is my solicitor, he would say. How to listen. With the ears, of course, where every story enters, spirals in and away. Not with the nose, though many do listen that way. The trouble is, our bony convexities can't quite forget the thought of themselves. Our pernickety nose, our fingers making their point, our feet in the door. Listen with the hollows of the body. The ears, yes, and the eyes, and the mouth, and, I recommend, the undersides of the knees. Is the listener sitting? Well, under the knees, unseen, concave, a cradle. That's where the wild-eyed stories will come. Then, next day, next month, or the next, let's slip, let's spout out under the table what was done, where, how. What about listening to Victor, though? the Gambia's star tracker down of dissidents. I think that the experience of visiting, maybe those seven locked doors work as a sort of protection for us, the visitors. The experience of visiting somehow makes it possible both to empathise with Victor and to preserve one's own separate self. We were in the brightly lit visits room at the removal centre. We must have been. We were sitting opposite each other. Victor needed to speak, to tell me his story. So we sat in almost total darkness in the front seats of an unmarked army car. 
we were, both of us, staring at a doorway at the top of an iron staircase that connected the street with an upper room. There was a light over the door of this upper room, the only lighting this deserted little back street in the Gambia possessed. We were in the brightly lit visits room at the removal centre and Victor needed to tell me his story. We sat side by side, staring at the doorway at the top of the iron staircase, Victor fingering the trigger of the gun the army had equipped him with. And he wouldn't miss. That was what had forced him into this situation, his expertise with a rifle. We sat in silence, staring up, the urgency of Victor's story was such that his words were transformed into taut, wordless experience. We were waiting in the army car outside the offices of a local left-wing newspaper. The journalist Victor had been told to shoot was taking his time and my visiting time was almost up when the door at the top of the staircase opened and the journalist appeared. We were in the brightly lit visits room at the removal centre. I was going to stand bail for Victor so he could have a taste of a sort of freedom in the UK. His case collapsed though, his solicitor didn't turn up and the Home Office had an easy ride. Victor was taken to Colnbrook and from there back to the Gambia. It was an utterly grim ending of his time here, removal and the near certainty of arrest and torture on his arrival home. Mr. Tuesday from Sierra Leone had a very different experience. Mr. Tuesday had served at least one prison sentence when he came to Dover to await removal. He had been brought up as a child soldier in Sierra Leone and was, I think, traumatised by that experience. He was stateless, unknown to the Sierra Leone Embassy, and he waited on and on in detention, sometimes composed, sometimes crazy. Eventually, bail was requested, and we went to London feeling rather foolish and completely without hope. Mr. Tuesday's lucky day. It was a Thursday when the handle of my pan flew off and left me holding only it and not the porridge that was boiling up inside. Some things turn out well. The judge heard Mr. Tuesday's case that day. Against him there was ducking, dodging, bolting, previous convictions, heatedness. But since he was so minded, the judge said, Mr. Tuesday, it's your lucky day. And granted not his understanding, but a sort of freedom which rose, well, not freedom, not waking up on Friday morning with no fear, no soldier childhood howling on and on inside his head, rose up in Mr. Tuesday and poured over. He knelt for joy and wept and punched and disappeared, went into destitution, clutching a black sack. Visiting detainees brings great richness into your life, both sad and happy. But it also brings you face to face with waiting. Not waiting to get in for a visit, that's nothing. It's waiting with. If people are in prison, they have a date of release to live for. If they're in detention, they have no date to live for. They're waiting for whenever. And you're sitting, waiting with them.
The Believing of Trees There's no need to finger the wounds of the trees to believe them. You can trust telltale scars, branch loss, uprootedness. Even their stories don't have to be true to be true of them. Stand in their presence. Breathe in time with them. Wait with them.